I'd like to welcome you all to the fourth and final webinar in UC Irvine Extension's fourth annual GATE webinar series. Tonight's topic is Technology Tools for GATE, GATE Teachers. This session is being recorded and the recording will be available within 24 hours. If you registered through Extension's free events website, you will automatically receive an email with a link to this recording. If for some reason you do not receive the email, you can access the archive manually by going to uci.webex.com, clicking on the Event Center tab, and then clicking on View Event Recordings. This presentation will be listed with other recordings, so you would simply need to search for this webinar's title. My name is Lisa Kotowaki, and I am a program representative here at UC Irvine Extension. Tonight I am logged in on behalf of my director, Angela Jante. Here is a brief overview of what we are going to cover in this webinar session. First, I'll start off with a quick overview of WebEx features so that you'll know how to submit questions throughout the presentation to our featured speaker. Next, I will provide you with some information about several GATE resources offered through UCI Extension, including our fully online Gifted and Talented Education Specialized Studies program. I will cover the requirements for the program, fees, and some upcoming courses for our spring quarter, which begins on March 26. I will then hand it over to Ian Bird, who is our pre presenter tonight. Ian will be presenting on tonight's topic, Technology Tools for GATE Teachers. At the end of his presentation, we will have a brief Q&A session. Finally, I will leave you with my contact information so that you can send me any additional questions that we didn't address. If you encounter any technical difficulties during the webinar tonight, please shoot a chat message over to UCI Robert, and he will be able to help you troubleshoot any issues. If you have a question for Ian regarding the content of this presentation, please submit it in the Q&A box and we will address it at the end if we have time. If you look at the top of the participant list on the right-hand side of the screen, you should see a row of icons. Press on the question mark icon and the Q&A panel will show up. Please feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation and we will address them at the end of the webinar. Here is a brief overview of the GATE Specialized Studies program we have here at UC Irvine Extension. Our certificate program is fully online and consists of nine quarter units. Students have the opportunity to pick from a variety of electives with different unit values to make up those nine units. Since the program is fully online, we are open to individuals here in California as well as around the country. Our program is taught by a team of experts and is designed for individuals new to the field as well as current GATE educators seeking professional development opportunities. To be eligible for this certification, Students must complete all nine units with a grade of C or better, as well as a completed application for candidacy. The courses in the program range from $350 to $500 per course, depending on the unit value. You may take individual courses without pursuing the entire certificate program. Here is a list of electives that make up our GATE certificate program. Regardless of which electives you choose to satisfy the nine unit requirement, our program will help you develop a new skill set and gain a deeper understanding of the needs and issues of this diverse group of students. When viewing the course schedule, you'll notice that not all classes are offered every quarter, so please plan accordingly. Pay close attention to the unit value of each course because this dictates how long a course will last. For example, you can expect Learning Styles, a one-unit course, to cost $350 and last four weeks online, while Differentiated Instruction, a three-unit course, costs $500 and lasts 11 weeks online. The nice thing about our Specialized Studies program is that you can earn your certificate in as little as nine months and can choose only the courses of greatest interest to you. Here is a list of the courses that we are offering in the upcoming spring quarter. 
differentiated instruction at three units, learning styles at one unit, and the arts and gate education at two units. Each course is listed with its start and end date, as well as the online course fee. The course schedule and enrollment information are also posted on our website. Registration for spring courses is currently open, and students may enroll either online, by mail, over the phone, by fax, or in person through our Student Services Office. We encourage students to enroll at least two weeks prior to the start of a course. UC Irvine Extension also provides individual courses, specialized in-services, and the entire GATE certificate program on-site or online to schools and districts at reduced prices. We currently work with several school districts who are putting cohorts of teachers through our GATE program and are receiving 10, 15, or 20% off course fees. With one district, we send our university-approved instructors to teach the classes on site at their district office. With other districts, we provide customized online courses available only to teachers from that particular school district. In any case, we hope that there is an opportunity for UCI Extension to meet your GATE training needs. If you wish to learn more about our program and discount, discount offers, please email me or call the number listed on this slide. As you may already know, UC Irvine Extension hosts an online GATE community that is free and open to the public. Please follow the directions on this slide to become a member, and you will gain access to valuable resources, news, and events regarding GATE. Recordings of all of our past webinars are available through the community, so I do encourage you to join. And this webinar that we're doing tonight is the last webinar of our fourth annual series. So I would expect sometime next week that all of the recordings from this month will be posted to this free GATE community. Next month, California Association for the Gifted, commonly referred to as CAG, is hosting its 50th annual conference in Palm Springs, California. UC Irvine Extension is proud to be a credit provider for this event. In order to receive one unit of credit, individuals must attend the CAG conference, submit an enrollment form with $120 payment, and write a two-page reflection paper summarizing what you learned at the conference and how you will apply what you learned to your teaching practice. The deadline for all submissions is April 4, 2012. Not only can this credit be used as proof of a professional development for salary advancement, it can also be applied toward UC Irvine Extension's GATE Specialized Studies program. For those of you attending the conference, please look for the enrollment form at our table or email me in advance. I will also be attending the conference, so some of you may be able to pick up a form from me um, in between one of the sessions. To wrap up my portion of the presentation, hopefully you saw some courses that piqued your interest, and we hope that you will consider adding our fully online GATE program to your credentials. This slide has my contact information, as well as my directors, so please feel free to contact us with any questions. Tonight's presenter is Ian Bird, who has taught sixth grade GATE since 2007 and was a gifted student himself. I had the honor of watching Ian present at CAG last year and was blown away by his tech-savvy approach to teaching. I knew right away that I wanted him to present for our webinar series this time around, so I am very, to, I'm very happy to turn it over to him now. Ian, are you there? Right. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Thanks, Lisa. Perfect. Okay, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Ian Bird, and I teach in the Garden Grove Unified School District. And I also have a website, uh, birdseed.com, where you can follow along with um, gifted ed ideas. So I'm very excited to be presenting about technology tools um, that you can use in your classroom for your, for your own benefit and also for um, working with and instructing your students. 
So the first thing we're going to think about is um, as teachers who work with gifted students, we need constant uh, sources of inspiration um, because we rarely can just use our curriculum um, as it was written. And so here's an image of the muses from ancient Greece, and this is a source of inspiration for artists and thinkers. Um, but for us today, I think of as mind muses, um, we use the internet as inspiration. So I find all kinds of ideas online that I can bring into my classroom and adapt um, to interest my students and challenge them um, and entice them to be excited about what we're learning. So there's all kinds of websites out there that we use, um, and sometimes it can be a challenge for us to keep track of them all. And so this first tool that I'm going to talk about is a technology tool for you as a teacher um, to find inspiration quickly and easily so you can um, use your time most efficiently. And so this tool is Google Reader, uh, which you can find at reader.google.com. And Google Reader is a way that you can subscribe to websites um, rather than having to visit them one by one every day. So I think back to when I was a child and I really liked to go to the bookstore and look for the new magazines. And um, so I would go all the time and go see if the new ones are there. But it's a very inefficient way to keep up with things because a lot of the times there would be no new magazines. And so, of course, it's much more efficient and cost effective to subscribe just to the magazines. And then they're delivered to your house as soon as they're ready. And so Google Reader is a tool that allows you to do the same thing with websites. They get delivered sort of straight to your computer instead of you having to go and search for inspiration on your own. So this symbol uh, represents the ability to subscribe to a website. Um, this technology is called RSS and it's what powers Google Reader. So you may or may not have seen this little orange icon on some websites, but it is very common. Uh, and so here are some sample images from uh, large and small websites. And so you can see Time Magazine has subscribed with RSS feeds. Life Magazine has the RSS symbol, uh, Education Week, Orange County Register, and my site, all, all kinds of sites, big or small, offer um, subscription to RSS. And it's symbolized by that little orange icon. And Google Reader is a tool that you can use to subscribe using RSS. So this is what um, Google Reader looks like. So at one point in time when I opened up Google Reader, um, this is what it looked like for me. So there are several sections here. So I'm going to go through them one by one. Over on the left, this is a list of all the websites that um, I'm subscribed to. So the great thing about subscribing to these sites using Google Reader is it's completely free um, and there's no commitment. You just click on that little orange icon and it links into Google Reader. If I get tired of subscribing to a site, maybe it's not interesting anymore, um, it's very easy, like two clicks, and I'm unsubscribed. Um, and so it's very easy to subscribe, unsubscribe, and it doesn't cost any money. So you can subscribe to all kinds of websites that offer um, subscri subscriptions to RSS. And then over here on the right, the large column, um, these are all the updates that have happened since the last time I checked on Google Reader. So all the sites that I've subscribed to, um, they get put into this big long list over here and it's arranged chronologically. So I can go through and just scroll through this list and see what's been updated um, on all the websites that I subscribe to. So everything gets put into the same bucket, and I can scroll through um, and catch up with what's been going on with my website. So a site that updates very infrequently, just like once a month or so, I'm still going to get to see that without having to go to the website every day and check. It will just show up here in my Google Reader. So it's very quick to sort of scroll and scan for what's interesting to me. And if it's not interesting, I can just pass by it, or I can stop um, and look more closely at it. If something is very interesting and I want to kind of save it for later, um, Google Reader allows you to star items. So here I've starred um, this update. And then starred items, I can go back and they're kept separately so that I can get to them very easily. So over on the left, there's also a starred item category. So as I'm going through, I can star updates that interest me, something I might want to use later. And then I can come to Google Reader and click on the starred items link. 
and it will take me to a new page that just has all of my starred items kept separately. So I kind of think of this as sort of the modern like newspaper clippings. I can go through in the morning, sort of scan through, see what interests me. The things that I like, I can sort of cut out by starring them. And then later, maybe in the afternoon, when I have more time, I can go back and explore things in more detail. So um, I can go through Google Reader and go through all my updates very quickly by using a couple keyboard shortcuts. So I click N, and that takes me to the next new item on my list. And if it's something I want to save for later, I just click F, and it is saved into um, my starred item category. So um, this makes it very quick for me to go through and find all kinds of inter interesting inspiration that otherwise might have passed me by. So Google Reader is uh, a great way to, to stay in touch with a wide variety of sources. So I subscribe to lots of education websites, but also technology and music and cooking websites. Um, and it's amazing how all those different resources come in handy. Um, and you kind of never know what's going to inspire you um, and interest your students. So Google Reader is a free service. Um, there are other RSS readers available, but Reader is the most popular. And if you already have a Google account, then you're already signed up. You just have to go um, to reader.google.com to get started. And as you explore websites, you might start to notice that little RSS symbol, which means that you can subscribe for free through Google Reader. The next tool that is useful specifically for us as teachers is Twitter. Um, and so Twitter, I know on the news we always hear about, you know, Justin Bieber has a lot of Twitter followers or which celebrity is breaking up with, with which celebrity on Twitter. Um, but there's much more to Twitter than just celebrities uh, talking to each other. It's actually a really rich environment for um, educators to have 24-hour professional development. Um, and once you start taking a look at it, if you haven't already, um, I think you'll be kind of surprised by um, the amazing discussions that are going on with Twitter. So Twitter um, is a way of updating statuses, but you, you only get 140 characters per update. So it's very short, very quick um, updates, and a lot of times people will use it to link to other uh, resources. So if you go to Twitter.com, you can search to see what's going on. Um, and so a good way to start searching is to use GT Chat. Um, and this is sort of a tag that people will use when they're talking about gifted, talented education. Um, and so if you go there and search GT Chat, um, you'll find something like this will come up. And these are all tweets that different people have put out there that are related to gifted ed. So you might see people. Um, writing up their thoughts about a conference they've been to, talking about gifted children who are introverted and um, how we can help them, um, gifted students who are also dyslexic. Uh, so you can see just from this little sample, there's a very wide variety um, of very helpful and interesting resources that people are linking to. And a lot of these people are teachers who work with gifted students, um, or they are um, like organizations that work with students. And so it's a lot of people who are interested in the same thing. Um, that we're interested in. So GT Chat is a way to quickly sort of find what's going on with Gifted Ed on Twitter. Um, so I'm on Twitter. I follow, at this point, I was following 193 other people, um, and none of them are big celebrities, but a lot of them are teachers and parents um, and organizations who work with gifted students. Um, and again, you can follow whoever you're interested in, um, but there's all kinds of teachers out there that are using Twitter to discuss education. So if you're just getting started, Twitter offers um, an easy way to find people to follow. So you can look for who to follow. And then I type in gifted education here. And you see Hoagie's Gifted is up there, Gifted Phoenix. Zales Jewelers has nothing to do with Gifted Ed. It is just an ad. Um, but this is a quick way to find people who are associated with a certain topic that you might be interested in. And then you can click to follow any of these people. And just like with Google Reader, you can follow and unfollow. It's free, and there's, uh, there's no commitment if you, if you are uninterested in following somebody. So if you want to um, start exploring Twitter, uh, these are some people who 
might be useful for you as someone who works with gifted students. Um, Deborah Marcino is the person who sort of runs GT Chats, and she hosts a couple of chats on Fridays that are international discussions um, where you can meet some very interesting people and find some interesting resources to work with your gifted students. Uh, the Head Knuckle and KTV are both teachers. Um, gifted HF is uh, their organization that works with homeschooling gifted students. And then, of course, Hoagie's Gifted um, has every gifted resource in the world on their website. And so uh, they're a great group to follow also. So Twitter is more than just you know, following celebrities. But um, if you start exploring on there, it's going to be a really great resource, um, another inspiration for you as a teacher to bring into your classroom and to collaborate with people um, who are out there doing the same thing that you are. And uh, I'm always inspired and amazed by the stuff that people are doing out there uh, on Twitter. So again, it's another free resource, something that you can use for yourself. Okay, so now uh, we're going to talk about, in the classroom, some things that I, I think of as my tech commandments. So when I'm going to bring technology in and use it with my students, these are things that I try to follow. Um, so the num number one is that I don't want to use technology just to use it, because then we're kind of missing the point and we're just, you know, playing around. And so um, when, when I bring in something that is a, a tool, a technology tool, I want to make sure that it is serving a useful purpose and is really helping my students and causing them to think more deeply and interact with a topic um, in a more deep way. I also want to demand quality from my students. And so anytime we start something, I want to remember in the beginning to uh, talk about my expectations in terms of quality. And so here we have an image uh, that has a watermark in it going across the middle. Um, and I know students use use images like this all the time. They just drag it off any website, and it's got this big, ugly word going across it. And so this is an example of something I would say, you know, this is not what I'm expecting from you guys. I want, I want to see something that's high quality that doesn't have, you know, a copyright going right through the middle of it. Um, I also talk to them about pixelated images. They'll go online and get an image that's too small and then stretch it really big. Um, and it looks very blocky or blurry. Um, and so we go through some examples and non-examples of what quality looks like whenever we're starting um, a project like this, so that in the end, I'm not sort of disappointed by how things look. Um, we should also follow a, like a writing process when we're working with technology. Um, I know we have a, tech, a tendency, at least I have a tendency to we go straight in and we start trying to publish right away without going through a process. Um, and just like with writing, it really improves the final product um, if, if we go through a process that begins with um, a pre-write or planning and then draft. And at each stage, I want to approve what they've done so far so I can catch errors or um, problems with their thinking early on instead of waiting for them to go through all this work and then in the end, um, I'm sort of disappointed with what they've produced. So I like to have a bunch of checkpoints, just like in a, in a writing process where I can collect a pre-write or a draft and check in on their progress before they've invested too much of their time into it. So this guy in the computer lab should not be planning what he's going to do. He should already have it planned and approved and should be working on only publishing when he's on the computer. The other thing is when whenever we introduce our students, to something we have to allow some play time because uh, it's going to be too exciting for them to just follow what we're talking about and what we want them to do. So whenever I introduce a new program or a new website, um, it really helps the students to have some time just to play around with it because uh, they're so intuitive, especially with technology. They'll figure a lot of things out on their own, um, and then it sort of gets out of their system. So I might spend, give them half an hour to play around or a computer lab block or 10 minutes depending on how uh, complicated the tool is that we're introducing. And so I find that this really reduces my frustration if I let, the, let them sort of get it out of their system and it improves their own understanding because they learn sort of intuitively by playing with the technology. And then at the same time, once they've had play time, um, we have to limit their playing. And so otherwise, students will fiddle 
with the different fonts and uh, colors and all their different options and transitions. So after they've had a chance to play and try everything out, once we start actually creating something, um, I make sure to limit and maybe say, you know, you can choose two or three fonts, um, choose three colors to use, you can choose one transition in your PowerPoint slide um, to, to take away some of that plane so that they can get things done more quickly. Otherwise, it'll be two months will go by and we're still working on the same project. And then when we do publish, um, I think it's important to publish something in a meaningful way. So um, here we have an image of like a CD. So if students have written a song or recorded themselves, um, it really kind of respects the work that they've done to publish it in a way that is meaningful. So um, I would burn copies of the CD and give it to them. Or we've made movies in the past. Um, and then anyone who brings like a blank DVD in, we can burn the movies for them and give it to them. So, um, you know, they spend all this time making something using um, technology, and then we can use technology to publish it. And, you know, it's something that some of them will hold on to for years and remember, you know, that time that they made a movie in Computer Lab. So I think publishing is important um, and to publish in a meaningful way for them. Okay, so PowerPoint presentations. Uh, when I first started teaching, I thought, oh, students, you know, will do presentations on topics they're interested in. Um, and then I discovered all these problems with uh, the way that they present using PowerPoint. And I'm sure lots of you have struggled with these same, same things, um, where they have slides that are way too complicated and busy, way too many words, uh, and then they present by facing their back to the audience and reading their slides in a really quiet voice. Uh, and so, you know, presenting is a really important skill, no matter what job you have, you know, it's something we need to prepare our students for. Um, and so this is a way that I've been working with my students to um, help them with their presentation skills and improve our PowerPoint sessions. So the first thing is to give them examples of people speaking who are excellent speakers. So when we want them to write, you know, we give them good quality writing. Uh, and so when we want them to speak, we should give them examples of outstanding speakers. Um, and so when I first started teaching, the iPhone was brand new. And um, I used this video of the iPhone announcement. Um, and so my students were just fascinated. They loved watching um, Steve Jobs present. And we talked a lot about, you know, here's somebody who is presenting for like two or three hours. Um, he's so calm up there. You know, he's really an excellent presenter. Um, and so as we watched this, and we watched just little segments each day for a few minutes, um, and as we watched it, students would um, sort of analyze what makes him an excellent presenter. And we broke this sort of a circle map up into uh, three sections. And so we paid attention to how he uses his voice, um, how he uses his body language, and then also how he uses technology um, to be an excellent speaker. And so we would go through and students would notice, you know, his voice is very calm and he uses inflection and changes his volume. We talk about his body language and how he would walk around the stage. Um, and technology, we talked a lot about the way that he set up his slides. Uh, he never looks back at his slides and he uses um, a little clicker to make sure that he's not um, tied to his laptop. He can walk around and be very natural. So we watched the iPhone. Um, movie. We watched more um, like historical figures like Martin Luther King. Um, and so students had a variety of speakers and presenters that they could use. Um, and then we talked about, you know, each person has something specific they can focus on. So some students would pick one item that they want to focus on with their next presentation. So it might be using their hands naturally. It might be speaking with a loud voice. And so this gave me a very easy way to provide feedback to them. So if I knew they were working on body language, I could help them and point out what they had done well in improving. So when we begin these presentations, the first thing they do is plan on paper. And so we do not waste our precious computer lab time by planning or thinking up ideas. Instead, we can do it in class. And we do it on super low tech, just a piece of paper that we fold up um, and each one of those boxes is going to represent a slide. So they can write it out, and then I can approve it before we even go to lab. So this is something that really helped um, sort of iron out the kinks of how they were going to make their slides. 
Um, so a lot of their slides before we started doing this, they would just sort of copy and paste this huge paragraph, and then they would just read it. So I wanted to eliminate the uh, reading a giant paragraph. And so we talked about in these videos we watched, Steve Jobs just put a very small number of words. He did not read his slides to the to the audience. So um, one of the rules that we have is that there's a five word limit um, per slide. So something like a title is something to let the audience know what you're talking about. And then the rest is should be the presenter speaking in an interesting way. So some of them have a very hard time keeping it to five words, but this is a very easy limit for them to understand. Five word limit. And then when possible, it's even better to just use an image or an image with a picture because we talk about a picture being worth a thousand words. Um, and so all the slides can either be a few words or um, it can be an image about what they're talking about. And then everything else should just be them speaking and connecting with the audience. And then we talk about keeping it simple. And so this image is of a guy who did not keep it simple. He's got way too much stuff going on on his bicycle. Uh, and so we talk about, you know, if we're going to use a transition, pick one transition on your slides and use it uh, through the whole presentation, pick colors that go together and stick with those colors. Um, and so we talk about those slides we've seen that have too many animations and it makes the computer start stuttering and then it all goes wrong. And so we don't want uh, a complicated PowerPoint slide. We want something that is going to help us understand the presenter. And then when students would present, I would have some students who would talk forever and ever and ever about their topic, and then I would have students who would be so nervous that they would freeze up and they wouldn't know what to say. Um, and so as a teacher, it was always a big challenge for me how to uh, sort of limit some people and encourage other people to keep moving. Um, and so this is something that I um, drew inspiration from um, what's called Ignite from O'Reilly, um, and they, they time their slides. So my students will develop 15 slides for their presentation, and then we set an auto timer, um, which, which is in PowerPoint or Keynote or any of the presentation software. So their slides will automatically advance after 15 seconds each. Um, and so this way, I know each presentation is going to be a little less than five minutes. Um, students who talk for too long are limited automatically because the slides will advance. And then students who get very nervous and sort of freeze up, um, they only have to wait a few more seconds and their next slide comes up and it often helps them to get moving again. Um, and so these, these are some rules and some techniques that I set up with my students to really help uh, improve their public speaking and their PowerPoint presentation. And to go back to our pre-writing, our planning phase, um, so if they fold it into eight boxes, that gives them 16 boxes front and back. And so um, we use each one of those represents one of their 15 slides. Um, and then there's an extra box. Um, and so I can OK it. And then they already have their 15 slides sort of planned out. So then when we go to Computer Lab, they know, oh, I'm going to look for an image of an apple. Or I'm just going to type in the word Red Delicious on this slide. And so it makes um, the creation of their slides much faster than if they were sort of playing around and coming up with their ideas as they sat there in computer lab. So this has been something that's worked really well for my students, um, and it makes our presentations much more enjoyable for me. And you know, they, they get so nervous when they're up presenting in front of their peers that I think the structure really helps them to sort of focus on presenting and not worrying about all the other things that could, that could go on when they're up there. Okay, so um, one big project that I like to do with my students is to make movie trailers um, for a story that we've read. Um, and so I'm going to talk specifically about iMovie because at my school we have uh, an Apple um, computer lab. But I know I'm, if you're using a PC, I think Movie Maker can do a lot of the same thing. Um, so we're going to talk about how to, how to analyze a, a story and to sort of create a movie trailer that is not just showing action, but it's going deep into the story. The story that I'm going to use as my sample is The Giving Tree, because it's a, it's a great story to, uh, to show examples with, because it's very deep, but it's also a very quick story, and um, 
doesn't have too much action. So this is my example, is the giving tree. So the first step, we're going to do all this planning in the classroom, and then at the end, we're going to publish in Computer Lab, so, um, so you can sort of save that Computer Lab time for something really valuable. So I'm going to ask my students to develop a big idea based on the story that they've read or that we've chosen to do. And so a big idea could be the author's message, the theme, or the moral of the story. Um, so for my example, for the giving tree, my big idea is going to be that there's more to life than this. Once students have uh, decided on their big idea, which should only be a little sentence, um, we're going to create a poem, and this is based on this um, idea from Joan Smutney uh, called Free Verse Poetry. And so it's poetry, but it is very loose, and it doesn't have a lot of rules, so students um, aren't going to feel too constrained by trying to make everything rhyme and fit a certain pattern. Um, instead, we want to give them a chance to respond deeply and um, to get at the meaning of what they're talking about, what they've been reading. So the rules are there are six lines, and they are unrhymed. They can be any length. There's no syllable rule. Um, and they should be phrases, so they cannot be complete sentences. And then the seventh line is the big idea that, um, that they created. So the seventh line is sort of a wrap-up, and it is a sentence. The first six lines are just phrases. So um, I adapted this to be part of their movie trailer, and it's, it's supposed to be kind of like the voice that narrates over um, a movie trailer. So for my example, the seventh line I already have written is my big idea sentence, there's more to life than this. And so all of the other six lines are going to be uh, related to the story, uh, and they should be sort of coming from a specific point of view. So they could be written from the tree's point of view in the story, or the boy, um, or even an inanimate object's point of view. Um, and so they're going to be phrases that the students write to fill in those six lines. So my example for the giving tree, have fun, take my food, branches reach out, time passes slowly now, giving until gone, we age together, there's more to life than this. So as your students start to uh, develop these poems, um, a lot of them are very striking because, because of the way the poem is set up. It really gives them a lot of freedom, and when they read them aloud, um, sometimes I'm very surprised they're so powerful sounding, and they really sound like real poetry because the students aren't focusing on just rhyming back and forth. So once they have their poetry written, and you can okay it, or you can tell them to go back and fix it, um, we're ready to move on to the next part. So they're going to develop storyboards. Um, and so I talk to my students about, you know, when people are actually filming a movie, they do not just get a camera out and start filming. There's a huge process that leads up to it, and one of those is storyboards. And maybe you have a DVD that has behind the scenes, or you have a book that might show some sample storyboards, so you can find them online. Um, but it's very interesting to show the students, you know, what we're doing is, is a real-life thing. People have to come up with, like, a pre-write before they can get started, because it's so expensive to actually go and film the movie. So just like we did with um, the PowerPoint, presentations, we're going to start super low tech and we're going to fold a piece of paper. Um, and each one of these boxes is going to represent um, one of the sort of themes in our movie trailer. So we have eight boxes here. So we're going to have like a title screen to begin with and then the six lines that go with um, the poem that they just made and then the final boxes for their big idea. And so each one of these is going to turn into um, an image or a little scene um, that they're going to plan on paper. So students are going to begin now by sketching what they want each of these images to look like or each of these scenes to go with um, the lines that they've created. So here's my sketch for the line, giving until gone. So I've got the tree from our story is a stump now, and she has given everything until she's gone. So this sketch is going to go in my line five box, because giving until gone um, was my fifth line. And so we would go through, um, and they would come up with an idea 
of an image that goes along with each of the lines of their poem. And then again, this is a place where I can check on their progress, I can okay it, or I can tell them what they can improve so that we're working towards a really high quality product. Once I've okayed all of their um, sketches, we're ready to go and start drafting. And so now we're ready to go to the computer lab and we're going to start looking for images that match up with those sketches that they created. So my students immediately always go to Google Images, um, but I feel that Google Images creates a lot of problems because they tend to just drag these images in and they don't know where they found them and they don't know the copyright status or who the creator was. Um, so I, um, I restrict them to this website, Flickr, um, which is created by Yahoo or owned by Yahoo right now. Um, and Flickr is an image gallery where people can upload um, their own images. And so it's very easy to search for images here. Um, it's also easier to filter out things that might be inappropriate. Um, and the best part is that you can search based on copyright. Um, so you can look for images that the photographer has specifically allowed people to use, um, which we call Creative Commons. So when we search, there's also an option to do an advanced search on Flickr. And down at the bottom is, um, is the part that we're interested in. And so my students would click on the box that says only search within Creative Commons license content. Um, and so we have a little discussion. We have a little like mini lesson about um, you know using the internet and the idea that you can't just take anybody's um, creative works. But um, if people have licensed it using Creative Commons, they've given the okay for us to use their images as long as uh, we cite who created the image. So Flickr is good for giving a little more high quality images, and it also provides a way for you to talk to your students about. Um, you know, using the internet in a correct way and a way that respects um, creative people. So now we are searching for an image of a tree stump to go with the sketch that I did earlier. And you can see it says that we're um, searching only for images that are Creative Commons licensed. So there's going to be all kinds of images that they can find. Um, and once we find one that is sort of interesting, we can click on it. and this will bring it up in a, uh, a larger image. And so now we can, we can save these images um, onto the computer. And so you can see on here it says the license, uh, some rights are reserved, which means that we can use it um, and we see who it was created by, so we can give um, him credit. And then there's different sizes, so students can make sure that they are getting a large image um, and not something that is small and it's going to be all blurry or pixelated. So students are finding high quality images that they're legally allowed to use. And then they go through and they find an image to match up with each one of their um, sketches that they've made. And then I just have them make a folder on their desktop and they save these images um, into that folder. And then I also have them keep a little text file so that they are citing where they got their photos from. So they have a record, um, sort of like a bibliography of where they found these images. Um, and we also talk about, you know, students will sort of get distracted trying to find like the perfect image. Um, so we talk about, you know, finding something that just fits the idea of what you're looking for. And the words that we put over this are what's going to really um, drive home the meaning. So they've saved all their images now into a folder on their desktop. Um, and so eventually this image is going to have this title, Giving Until Gone, Overlaid on top of it. So once students have all their images saved, again, I, it would be a good point for me to do a check and make sure that the images are appropriate, that they're large enough size, that they've been saving uh, the contact information for who made the photo. And then once they've passed that, we're going to go into iMovie, um, which is installed on all of our computers. Um, and we're going to use that to actually create the movie trailer. So this is what iMovie looks like. Uh, it has been updated recently, and so I know uh, some teachers are not used to this new version. Um, but uh, so this is going to be based on the new version in case that's what you have in your computer lab. So we're going to look at that top left window first. It says to start a new project, select video and photos, and drag them into this area. 
So I'm going to have my students go to their folder, and they're going to drag um, all of their images that they're using into this area of iMovie. Um, and so they drag them in one by one, and then the images will show up in this area. And the first problem that students run into then is that um, each image has like a four second timer on it, and um, there's a zoom that happens by default. And so immediately everybody wants to get rid of that stuff or change it around to how they want um, how they want it to be. So this is how you change this because it's kind of buried in the options. So so here are some images that I have dragged into my iMovie window. And uh, so when you hover over one of these images, a little blue box is going to appear with sort of a gear on it. So if you click on the blue gear, uh, it's going to display a new menu. And so the first thing we're going to do is click on Clip Adjustments here. And this is going to be how we change the duration of the slide, because they're all set to four seconds right now which might be too fast or too slow, depending on what your students want. Once you click on, um, on that option, it's going to bring up another window, and the duration is right there. And so students can adjust it to be longer or shorter. And it's measured in seconds. Um, and then they, there's also an option here where they can choose to apply it to all of their um, images. And some of them will maybe want to play with the video effects there. So that might be something you give them a chance to play around with and then, again, limit sort of how much playing they can do once they're actually publishing. So now students have changed the length of each clip. And the second thing is each image is going to have this default zoom built into it. Um, and sometimes it looks nice, and sometimes it zooms into the completely wrong part of the image. So the way to change this is, again, click on that gear and the blue box. And this time, we're going to click on Cropping, Ken Burns, and Rotation. So this zoom is called the Ken Burns effect. So once they've clicked on that option, it's going to give them this, this image here. And um, the green box represents where the zoom begins, and the red box represents where the zoom ends. So you can see here it's going to sort of pan down a little bit throughout the four seconds. So students can drag those boxes around. They can resize them. Um, and so this is something that they can kind of play around with to get the hang of it. Um, and so it's just a way for them to automatically do a zoom um, or control it more based on what they want. If they don't want any zoom, they can go to fit or crop up there in the top left, and then the image will just be static. But students get very creative with how they use this zoom, and so it's interesting to see what they come up with. So after students have got all their images into iMovie, and then they've gone and they've adjusted their timing, they've changed the zoom how they want it to be, now we're going to add the titles in, uh, which are going to be those lines of poetry that we wrote earlier. So first, to, um, to add a title, to add the lines of poetry, we have to click on one of these um, images that we're using. And then once we click on it, there is a T located on the bottom right. And the T stands for title or text. And so when we click on that, it's going to um, apply text to the image that we selected earlier. And then underneath that T, it's going to give us um, a bunch of title options that students can choose from. And so um, I'm just going to pick the one called Lower. Um, but again, this is something that they can play around with. So once you click on Lower, it's going to apply um, this text to the image we selected. And so here's what it looks like right after you click on, on the Lower. Um, so students can choose fonts that they want to use. They can type in their line of poetry here. And then when they're finished, they click on the Done button up on the top right. And then it'll look something like this. So this is my slide or my um, image for branches reaching out. And again, students can um, students can change their fonts. They can change their colors, um, um, and they can play with that however however they want or however much you want them to. And then you'll know that you have uh, you've got the title working on that slide or that image because over on the left again now there's going to be um, a little like talk bubble above it that has the beginning of the title that you just put in. 
So that says dr, which is the beginning of branches. And you can see I have it set for 10 seconds on that one. So students will go through this process repeatedly. Um, and so they'll add, a, um, they'll add a title to each one of their images that they brought in. Um, and then they can play it, and you can test it and see how it looks. Um, and then the next step is going to be to get the movie out of iMovie and save it as a movie file. Um, so someone is asking how um, that I teach the students to use iMovie, and that we give them a tutorial. So um, this process is the way that I teach them to use iMovie. Um, and so I have an hour a week in the computer lab. So we would go through this, um, and it might take them two or three weeks to complete this. Um, but I sort of assume that they have no experience at iMovie. Um, and so we go step by step through this procedure so that, they, um, that they're learning sort of the basics. A lot of them have used it before, and so they're able to move more quickly. But I always have students who are new and um, they haven't used it. So this, this, is the, this project is a way for me to teach them how to use iMovie, and we can use it later. So once our students have got their images set up, they have the timing how they like it, they have the zoom how they like it, and they've got all their um, titles put in. Now we're going to export the movie to a movie file. And uh, this is very easy through iMovie. Um, you just go up to the share menu, and there's all kinds of options. So depending on, you know, if you have something special you want to do with it, you can do all kinds of different things. Um, but the simplest is just to go to export movie, and then this is going to save it as a file. Um, oh, I, I always have to tell my students to use uh, useful names, otherwise they, they use these very crazy, weird file names. So we talk about how to give something a, a name that's going to be useful later. So this one's called Giving Tree Trailer. And then there's some options at the bottom for how big you want the movie to be. Um, large might be too large for your purposes, so medium is probably a good setting. Um, and anything larger than that um, I don't think is really necessary. So once you've saved it, it's going to export, and hopefully they will save onto the desktop or somewhere that's easy to find. So at this point, um, students would have a movie trailer that has their um, poem written on the bottom. Um, we don't have enough time today, but what I would do next to teach them um, another piece of technology is to use uh, GarageBand. And so in GarageBand, they can bring in their movie trailer that they're working on. And they can um, either write music to go with it, or they can use the built-in soundtrack to find something that is appropriate for the tone that they're creating. And then um, they can also record their voices over so that they can go for that uh, deep, manly narrator voice that we hear on the TV. Um, and so they can create uh, the sound to go with their movie trailer. And then um, after that, um, the Apple computers have a program called iDVD. And iDVD lets you um, put everybody's movies onto one DVD, and it creates um, some pre-built um, menus and animations. So it looks very professional. Um, and so I put everybody's movies onto a DVD using iDVD. And then um, anybody who wants to take um, this home and watch it at home, they bring me a blank DVD, and then I burn it and give it to them the next day. Um, and so it's a really cool project to go all the way through and actually give them a product that they can take home um, and show their family. Um, and then it's always a really big hit at like open house um, for families to come in and watch all the different movie trailers that students have made. Um, and at the same time, um, it's sort of a response to literature activity because they're writing poetry about author's message. And so it kind of hits a lot of interesting um, things that we have to do as teachers. Okay, so that brings me to the end. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, and um, I know we might have moved fast through some areas, or you might have specific questions, um, you can email me, ian at birdseed.com, and my website is there. And if you do decide to go on Twitter, or if you're already on there, um, I am Birdseed Gifted there. Um, so please send me questions or um, comments if you want to get in touch with me. All right, thank you so much, Ian. We're going to go ahead and spend, we have about five minutes, so we can take a couple questions from people who are logged in today. If you have a question for Ian, go ahead and look 
above on my screen. I'm I'm on a PC, so I'm not sure if it's different for a Mac, but I I'm looking at the in the upper right hand corner there's like a row of icons. You're gonna want to press on the question mark icon and the Q and A panel will show up. I I know that some people have already been using it, so that's great. Um, and we can take some questions from attendees. I did have one question, Ian. When you're introducing a new tech tool like iMovie or something similar to that, how do you make sure or do you have any tips for teachers on how to make sure that their students stay focused on the task at hand and don't kind of just go off exploring on their own and, and messing around um, with the tool? Yeah, so that um, I work with sixth graders, so they tend to be pretty good at following the task. Um, Part of it is giving them some time to play, um, like I said, because otherwise they can fiddle for hours and hours. Um, mm -hmm. So if they get that chance to kind of get it out of their system and then they can use what they've learned um, when they're actually doing the task, um, I think that that play time is very valuable um, to keep them on task later. And then the other the other side is, you know, if they're, if they're doing something that's really interesting, um, they do tend to stay on task more. And, you know, so this is something that's differentiated for them that's challenging and interesting and, um, you know, they're intrigued by the technology aspect of it, too. Okay, great. Um, and we had one question from our participant, and I think you might have alluded to this during the presentation, um, but how long would it take the movie trailer assignment from start to finish? I think you mentioned that you usually introduce it to them and have them work on it for about three to four weeks, was that right? Yeah. Yeah, so we would, um, I try to get all the planning done in the classroom, um, and so it, it depends if they're working in groups, um, they might be able to get it done um, quicker. Um, so I would have them do it all in class to begin with up until we have to get those images. And then, um, yeah, I have an hour a week in the lab that I use, and so I would say I would probably budget in maybe four weeks. So four hours of time in the computer lab. And some people will get it done very quickly, so then you have to have like a backup uh, task <laughs> for them to work on. Mm -hmm. But, or else, you know, they can be, they can help other students too. So there's always a few people who are immediately like super experts, and mm -hmm. they can be very valuable in helping the other people too. All right, that, those are great suggestions too. Did you have any other questions in your, I know that you can get some chat messages that I, can't see on my end. Did you have any questions that you wanted to address or any other comments before we wrap up the webinar? Uh, no, I had somebody ask about using no. iPad as a tool. Um, I haven't, I have an iPad on my own, so I've used it just personally, but um, I don't have any experience using it um, with students. I know our school is also looking at getting them, so um, if anybody knows about using iPads as a school, I would love to hear from you, but I don't really know anything myself. All right, great. So I'm going to go ahead and um, move to the previous slide one more time just so that anybody who didn't get a chance to, you know, take note of his yeah. contact information. This is Ian's website, his email address, as well as his Twitter. If you, um, I encourage you to follow him on Twitter as well. And then there was a slide in the presentation with recommendations of um, some people Ian recommended to follow on Twitter as well. So this this presentation will be emailed to everybody who signed up through the free events website, so you can look for the, the email tomorrow um, afternoon and uh, follow any of those people that he recommended. All right, Ian, I want to thank you so much for wrapping up our webinar series tonight with such a fun topic. And I'd also like to thank all of you for logging in, and I hope that you enjoyed the entire webinar series. If you missed any of the webinars earlier this month or would like to rewatch the series at any time, the recordings will be uploaded to our online GATE community. Again, we are also offering a credit option for this webinar series for those of you who are interested. Um, if you attended all four live webinars, and the keyword here is live, so watching recordings will not count towards this credit option. And if you want to earn credit for watching the live webinars, please feel free to contact me at the email address listed on this slide and I can get you the enrollment form and um, some of the required information like what, what assignments you need to submit in order to receive the credit. 
So thank you again for your participation. And Ian, thanks again for presenting. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you.